Please take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 15, and I'm reading verses 1 to 11. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser, Jesus said. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. John chapter 15 and the first 11 verses, surely to the unregenerate mind will strike a number of chords. Pain, guilt, insult, threat. Pain, because Jesus here talks about pruning. He's talking about God taking his shears and removing some things. Guilt. Jesus here talks about us bearing much fruit. And how often has the message been sent out we need to pray more, we need to read the Bible more, we need to witness more, we need to give more, do more in order that you might be pleasing before the Lord. Guilt, for who of us can stand before God and say, oh Lord, I'm doing everything I should be doing. Insult, Jesus in verse five says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Zilch, there is nothing of any eternal or even temporal consequence for all your hurry and scurry. How insulting that is to the fleshly mind. Threat, Jesus, he talks about branches which are not bearing fruit, that they are cast into the fire and burned. But how different when we see what God's desire is here, not pain for pain's sake or guilt that we might be driven down, insult that we might have our ignorance exposed or threat that some club might hang over us, but see here an invitation to power an invitation to the love of God, the joy which is inexpressible in human terms, and an affirmation, a confirmation, that we are in fact following the Master and that we are His, a glorious invitation. Consider with me that Jesus is here in the very last moments of his final dialogue with his disciples. They have secluded themselves and they have shared a meal together. The final Lord's Supper, Jesus has predicted his betrayal and Judas has exited their company. Jesus has talked to them about discipleship. 
He has talked to them in various degrees. First of all, in John chapter 12, verses 24 to 26, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have the record of how that Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. John does not record those words, but he certainly records comparable ones here. Jesus saying, he who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am there, my servant will be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Jesus was here talking about the cost of discipleship. The cost of discipleship. In John chapter 13 and what was read for us out of verses 34 and 35, Jesus describes the character of discipleship. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And he says, by this, by this, all men will know that you are indeed my disciples, if you have love for one another. The cost of discipleship, the character of discipleship, what we have before us here in John chapter 15, verse 8, speaks of the confirmation of discipleship. Jesus says, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and in so doing, prove to be my disciples. Jesus, knowing that he had just a little while longer with his disciples, wanted to speak plainly about discipleship and what it would entail but though he might seem to be heavy-handed, Jesus concludes the end of chapter 16 with the comfort of discipleship. Jesus he here says in chapter 16, verse 33, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. Jesus wanted these disciples to have peace he knew and he says, in the world you have tribulation, but take courage, take courage. I have overcome the world. Jesus speaking of the cost, the character, the confirmation, and yet even though it seems to be such a heavy load, the rich comfort that we draw from Christ as his true disciples. In chapter 15, Jesus begins talking about the vine and the branches. He is speaking here one of the seven I am's which John records for us. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. Here he says, I am the true vine. Every one of the disciples, and indeed everyone who was a Jew, would understand the imagery of the vineyard for the nation of Israel. From Isaiah chapter 5, which was read for us, verses 1 to 17, the vineyard of God was the nation of Israel. But lest people would come and say, well, I can trace my physical lineage back to Abraham, I'm good, I'm all right. Jesus says to them, look, I am the true vine. If you think that just because you are related to Abraham, you are a shoe-in to the good graces of God, you need to understand that I am the true vine, and indeed my heavenly Father is the vine dresser. 
He is the one who is tending this vineyard. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away that which is extraneous, that which is unnecessary. There is a pruning, there is a removal that takes place. Every branch that bears fruit, it is not left alone, but there is a pruning which takes place, in fact, with the goal that it might increase even the fruitfulness which it has had hitherto. And Jesus says to these disciples, these few gathered round him this one last time, he says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now, perhaps our translations are helpful and sometimes they are a little bit difficult. In the translation I am using here in verse 2, it says, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. And then he says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. We need to use the same word for in fact it is the same word and the same meaning. Either we say Jesus or, or the Father cleans that branch that it bear more fruit and then say you are already clean or we say the Father prunes that branch. He cuts it back that the sap might be even more focused on the fruit bearing which is so important. Jesus is saying his father, he cleans that branch. He takes away what is extraneous and, and superfluous. He cleans. And the disciples, Jesus, he says, you have been cleaned. You have been pruned because of the word which I have spoken to you. How Jesus again honors the word of God. Paul writes that we come by to faith, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. These disciples, they had had a front row experience. They had had a privilege such as what we would love to have in hearing the word of God from the very lips of Jesus and of seeing his works. Well, that work, it had worked its way into their hearts and it had been that pruning effect. It had had that cleaning effect. Perhaps they were not even aware of it. And perhaps we are not aware of it as we read for ourselves or as we hear the word preached. But that word is doing its work. It is accomplishing God's eternal purposes. Jesus says to them, you are already clean because of the word. The word which you have heard me speak to you. Now, Jesus repeatedly, in rapid-fire motion, he speaks to them about abiding, abiding. How vital this is. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, unless there is that grasping, unless there is that connection, unless there is that point of vital contact that the power might flow into the branch and that fruit might result. Abide in me. Maintain that connection. And I also in you. The branch, of course, cannot bear fruit of itself. If, if it is cut off, it will immediately start to shrivel and wither. Of course, it cannot do anything of itself unless there is that vital, important connection. So we can do nothing unless we are connected to the main stalk. And Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you indeed can do nothing. Nothing. That is insulting to the proud mind of man. But Jesus was simply laying it on the line that there is nothing that our hurry and scurry that all of our busyness can accomplish if 
it is not surrendered, if it is not so vitally connected to him and to him alone, we deceive ourselves. We fool ourselves to our eternal detriment if we think that we are doing things when in fact all of it doesn't mean anything whatsoever. Jesus then has some questions that he puts to us. They are veiled, but Jesus, he says, if anyone, there is a question here, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. They gather them and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. That is the one option, the one side of the coin. If, in fact, someone goes that direction of detaching themselves, though in appearance there might be still some proximity, if there is, in fact, a detachment, there will be that day when the lack of sap when the life is not flowing, and it will be made evident. Verse 7, but if, once again, if you do abide in me, if that connection is maintained, and my words abide in you, Jesus says, ask whatever you wish. There will be a power, there will be a connection, there will be a life-giving flow, such as this world has no notion of. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The purpose of God is that God might be glorified. And Jesus comes to this, my Father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. The purpose, of God, the purpose of Jesus coming into this world was that God might be glorified in the redemption of lost men and women that Jesus would obediently go into this world and that he would redeem a people for his name. Jesus had done that. If these who come after him are to also glorify God, they are to be fruit-bearing also in their obedience to the plan of God and thereby giving glory to God. And not only giving glory to God, but that there might be evidence, that there might be proof of them as the very disciples of Christ. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Here is something that touches upon the love of God and the joy which exists within the heart of God. First of all, Jesus speaks of the love which the Father had and has for the Son. A love of such depth and of such magnitude our puny minds certainly cannot grasp such love of the Father for the Son, and the Son for the Spirit, and the Spirit back and forth, all about the Holy Trinity. Jesus says, now, just as this mind-blowing, mind-boggling love takes place within the Trinity, just as the Father has loved me with such a love. Jesus says a remarkable thing. He says, I have also loved you with that same character of love. And he now says, abide, dwell, remain, tabernacle, pitch your tent and remain right there in my love. Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, if you do what I tell you to do, if you take my word as the most vital and important thing over anything else that this world has to offer, then you will abide in my love. And just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So as the character of Jesus is, returning the love of the Father by keeping the commandments of the Father, 
So we now in turn are to love the Son even as he has loved us by hearing and responding obediently to the words of Christ. And here most especially he is saying, abide, abide, dwell. But just as we have this love which our heads struggle to wrap around, this divine love which goes beyond human comprehension, we also have the joy of God. Jesus here concludes, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy, a God type, a God like, a God charactered joy, a God sized joy may be somehow compressed and squeezed into you and that your joy would not be of this world, but that your joy would be otherworldly and that it might be made full. I hesitate to do this, but I will anyways. Hebrews chapter 12, which I try to work into just about every sermon I preach and the first three verses. We read, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside there we have the pruning that is taking place, those extraneous things that need to be set aside as we pursue godliness and holiness, as we walk as disciples of Christ, setting aside everything that entangles, everything that encumbers, all that extra baggage. We run with endurance the race that is set before us, Fixing our eyes upon Jesus, we are attentive to his words, we are connected to the stalk, we are connected to the vine as branches. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, our hope, our great aspiration, the author and, fin and perfecter of faith. And it says, who for the joy? Here it is speaking of God's joy who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Who for the joy. The joy of God was that he might redeem a world that had been lost in sin, a world that had gone its own way, a world that had spit in the face of God, a world that cared nothing what God had to say on any matter. Jesus said, I want you to have my joy. And even as he goes to the cross, he is speaking of the love of God. He's speaking of the joy of God. He is speaking to these who would take up their cross and follow after him. He would want them to have joy even when they would take their final breath when a sword was coming down on their neck, when at least one of them would be crucified, when they would give their very lifeblood in witness to the cross and to the crucified. Jesus, here he speaks, I've told you about these things, that you might have a supply, that you might have a means of sustaining yourself through those times. How does that happen? You stay connected to the main stalk. You stay connected to the true vine. And you will always be bearing fruit. You will always be advancing, moving forward in grace and to God's glory. The cost of discipleship is high. And Jesus plainly said, whoever doesn't count the cost and just sets out willy-nilly, beware of them. Jesus warned about the cost of discipleship. Jesus spoke plainly about the character of discipleship, that there was to be such a deep abiding love. 
He speaks of the confirmation of discipleship, that we can know that we are followers of Christ, bearing fruit for his glory and the comfort of discipleship, that he will be with us and that we can know his peace. Even though in the world there is much tribulation and hardship, yet we take courage. We are on the winning side. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your word. And we exult in our Lord and Savior. You have told us that we are to take up our cross and follow. That we are to be crucified with you. Our life is to be actually laid down. And the Apostle Paul understood this when he said, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And Paul, he came to know the love of God and the joy, the peace that passes understanding. Lord, I pray for each man and woman who is here that they would know the love of God, the joy of God, the peace, the comfort, the rich comfort of God, which will sustain in whatever trial and hardship this world throws at them. Lord, so may each of us grab hold of this simple five-letter word, abide. And even as you said it repeatedly, driving it home into the hearts of the disciples and through them into our hearts. So Lord, may we hear this and lay hold of it, not being forgetful hearers, but doers of the word, ready to abide, ready to dwell, to draw, Lord, daily upon your rich supply. So work your will. And for any who has anyone who has never yet come to bow the knee at the cross, let this be the day, O oh God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.